This morning we want to continue with our series and I want to remind you this morning where we ended last week. Last week we ended on two very high notes as we looked at this and we were we had talked about Peter here he was full of the Holy Spirit and he's preaching a fiery sermon and we saw it in Acts 3 chapter 12 uh, chapter 3 verse 12 and 13 next slide Peter saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd and he starts this really really fiery message and he's in the middle of preaching this and he reminds them that the one who has the one who has healed this lame man it's not Peter and John but it is Jesus and it is the same Jesus it's the same Jesus he wants them to know I'm not preaching something new I'm not introducing something new to you. You know who this is. This is the one who walked your streets. This is the one who healed the sick. This is the one who calmed the storm. This is the one who walked into this very temple and took all of those money changers tables and cast them out and overthrew them. This is the one who on the last day of the feast in the area of the temple shouted out his heart overflowing with, with love for the people and frustration at their empty religious ritual. This was the Jesus who shout, stood and shouted as they poured out ceremonially water from one of the springs and he shouted out everyone ho listen pay attention everyone that's thirsty come to me come to me and I will give you water and it's living water and it will spring up from within you and Peter wants them to know it's not us it's not about us it's about Jesus and brothers and sisters that is still the same today it's not about us it's about Jesus you know because we're human we when people don't accept our testimony when we live a Christian life and people mock us or or make fun of us or reject us or treat us unfairly because we're Christians and because we live a Christian life it's easy to get offended isn't it it's easy to get hurt isn't it because we're human and we are in human bodies and we have human hearts this is what we feel but brothers and sisters I want to remind you something of something so important this morning when those times come and it is hard and you do feel hurt don't take it personally because it's not about you did you know that People, when you are living for the Lord, it's not you, it's Jesus. It's not you people are rejecting, it's Jesus. It's not you that people are mocking, it feels like you, but it's Jesus. It's Jesus in you. It's Jesus through you. It's Jesus, the life of Jesus displayed through you. And when those times come when people do laugh or mock or oppose, go back to God and say, Oh, Jesus, you're more hurt than I am because you love them. And get your eyes and get your attention off of you and back to Jesus. And that's what Peter is saying here, in effect. Peter is telling them, it is that same Jesus. It's the one that you knew. It's the one that you heard. It's the one that you saw. It's the Jesus that you condemn to death. And it's a fiery sermon. And one of the high points of the sermon is in Acts 3.15. And we talked about this last week where he says, You killed the author of life. A strong it sounds a, a strong accusation, isn't it? But it wasn't just an accusation. He, Peter was not accusing. Peter was just saying the truth, wasn't he? He was saying, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Now here's the high point, and we talked about this last week. When Peter talks with them, and he comes to this point, and he says, you killed him. Pilate was going to let him go, but you handed him over, the author of life, and you handed him over to death. His point is not condemnation, but he's trying to get them to 
repentance, isn't he? And this is one of the high points that we talked about last week. It is not to condemn, but he's to bring them to the point where they see this is where they are. This is the way they're going. And he's saying you can turn around and go in the opposite direction. You have done wrong, but you can turn around and get it right with God. And the high point of what we looked at last week was that repentance is hope. It's not condemnation. It is an offer of hope. It's a word of hope. As I was preparing, uh, I'd been looking online and reading some things, and I came across uh, uh, a quotation from somebody who is absolutely not a Christian at all. But I really liked what he said. And it's from the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. And this is what he, and some of you say, oh yeah, 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 I know who that is. This is what he said in translation, roughly. If you do not change direction, you may end up where you're headed. Mm. If you do not change direction, you may end up where you're headed. And that's in effect. Now that's, that's somebody, that's wisdom from somebody who doesn't even know God and who taught a system of belief that was very opposed to God and His ways. But there was wisdom there, wasn't there? There was truth there. And Peter is saying to these people, turn around. It's not too late. It's not too late. Let me ask you something. Have you ever felt, have you ever thought, it's too late for me? I've gone too far? Have you ever thought that about yourself? You may have. Have you ever looked at somebody else who has gone down a path that is so wrong and so opposed to God? And have you ever thought as you've looked at their life, at their life and at that person and the road they're going and the brokenness of their life and the path that they've gone? And have you ever given up hope? And have you ever said, they've gone too far? There's no hope for that person. I want to tell you something this morning. As long as there is breath, there's hope. There's hope. It's not too late to repent. And we sometimes, as Christians, especially when we know the Word of God, for some of us, we're saying, Pastor, you may say, Pastor Jen, I don't really know what you're talking about this morning, but for some of you, you say, yes, 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 I understand what you're saying. There's the whole idea and there's the whole, that verse about the, the one who commits the unpardonable sin, right? Who blasphemes the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about that before? I know you have, many of us. Well, have they blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Have they committed an unpardonable sin? And it's too late for them and they cannot turn to God. Listen, brothers and sisters, be very, very careful about playing God in people's lives. We are quick to say, oh, look what they've done. There's no hope for them. They're condemned. And why can I say that? Am I being soft on sin? I'm not being soft on sin, but I want to point you to something from this story this morning. Here is Peter preaching to the people that said uh, to Jesus and about Jesus, crucify him, give us Barabbas. We don't want him. Send him to the cross. They rejected God. They rejected truth. They rejected love. They rejected Jesus. And here is Peter a few months later and to the very same crowd that said crucify him, Peter is saying what? He's saying repent, repent. There's hope. There's hope for you. It's not too late. Now, brothers and sisters, when I look at this and when I see this, it gives me hope for people that we look at as too far gone and it's impossible to help this person. They, they've blasphemed. Don't play God in people's lives. God alone, God alone knows when someone has gone too far. God alone knows when there's no hope left. And until that time, God is the one who makes that decision. God is the one who calls that. Your responsibility and my responsibility is not to say they've gone too far. 
your responsibility and my responsibility is to say what Peter said to people who had rejected Jesus. And what he said to them was, repent, repent. That's our responsibility, not to condemn, but to give hope. And that hope comes through repentance. And when there is repentance, it is not, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm going to change. I'm going to be better. Repentance is turning from the way we are going and turning to God. And when we do, Acts 3, 19 and 20, what comes? What does God bring? Here is the hope that is found in repentance. It is not condemnation, brothers and sisters. It is repent. Change your mind and your purpose. Turn around. Return to God so that, number one, your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean, number one. The times of refreshing. Oh, doesn't your spirit and your soul need the time of refreshing? That comes with repentance, brothers and sisters. And it doesn't come any other way. When we come to this point, this is what repentance does. Sins are erased and washed away. Times of refreshing come. And then that He may send to you the Christ, that Jesus may come to you. And we look at this when repent comes, and we, have, we, we live in a world that doesn't want to accept this way, right? We live in a world that doesn't want the effects of sin. We live in a world with people that don't want to feel the effects of wrongdoing and all of the terrible things they've done, but they do want refreshing, don't, don't they? They do want to feel better. And so what does the world do? If you don't choose this way, brothers and sisters, if you don't choose this way, any other way you choose will be the wrong way. There are people who don't want God's way, but they want to be religious. And so you know what they do? They do the best they can. They do good deeds. They try this way, or that way, or this religion, or that religion. But Peter said to those people from the words of God, return to God so that times of refreshing may come. In the world, there are others that say, religion, I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with religion. You people, you're deceived. But they still want refreshing. And so what does the world do? The world chooses another way. And maybe they choose the way of, I'll just do good deeds. I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. That's just, I, I can't stand that when I hear people say that. I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not religious. I'm just kind of spiritual. And when somebody tells me I'm sort of spiritual, do you know what? My antenna go beep, 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 beep. <laughs> it re they, they really do. And almost always when somebody says that, I think, oh, okay. They're choosing a way other than God. They're sincere, and I'm not condemning. They're sincere, but they have missed the road to God, and they've missed what repentance is. And then there are others that say, I'm not religious and I'm not spiritual at all, but I want refreshing. I don't want to feel the way that I feel. I don't want the guilt and the memory of my past life. And they may fill their lives with pleasures of this world, with shopping until they drop, as some people do, with affair after affair, this person to this person to this person, finding somebody that they think will make the difference in their lives, when the only one who will make a difference is not a person here, but the person, the man, Jesus Christ. And then there are others that will say, well, I don't want that. I just don't want to remember and I don't want to feel. And they may turn to alcohol and drugs and things like that. We live in a world Brothers and sisters, oh, it's so important that you and I, in our lives, in how we live and in what we say, that we offer to people around us the only hope there is, and that is repentance and returning and turning to God. Because if we don't, I'll tell you this, the world and the enemy will offer a million other ways to feel better. And people will feel better for a while, but it won't last long. It won't last long. And so we ended last week on a high point, 
Repentance is hope. Repentance is not condemnation. And I want to say that to you this morning as well. I don't know where you are spiritually, some of you, but I say to you, repentance is hope. It is not condemnation. And when we repent, the times of refreshing from the Lord come, not from people and not from a church, but from God Himself, from God Himself. I want to show you one other thing here. This is the Amplified Version. And if you'll remember a couple of months ago, we talked, I, I taught a series, I preached a series on who keeps a record of sins. Do you remember that? And we went all the way through all those wonderful promises um, about God, people do and Satan does, but God never keeps a record of sin. Here we see that again because God puts the Bible together so beautifully with the themes repeated over and over that he wants us to hear and to remember. And here in the Amplified, we have a, a further explanation of what we talked about. Look at this verse right here, uh, this, the top part of this verse. He says, turn around and return to God so that what? That your sins may be erased. And in the Greek, it means blotted out or wiped clean. And I want to talk about this, these two expressions right here just a minute. Ink in the ancient world, and now by the way, don't say, wow, Pastor Jennifer, you know all sorts of things. I don't. But I, I do research and, and, I, and, and I do a fair bit of studying. But ink in the ancient world did not have, is not like ink today. Um, you know, when you write something, unless it's a special ink that you can erase or whatever, usually when you get ink on something today, it's there, right? It's not coming out. Men, if you get it in your shirt, mm, take it to the cleaners as soon as you can to try to get ink out. Or we get, ink, we get pens on some of these chairs and we work really hard. It's hard to get it out. Or it's on a piece of paper. It's really hard to get the ink out. But the ink of the ancient world at that time was, was different and it didn't have a lot of acid in it. So when, it was, when, when they wrote, it was very easy just to take a cloth before it dried or whatever, it was very easy to take a cloth and literally just wipe it off. And it would almost, almost, e almost completely, you could just take, you could take a cloth or something like that after ink had been, had been written on a piece of paper and just wipe it and it was gone. And it was done very easily. And that's the idea that, um, that, is, that Peter is saying right here, that your sins may be erased blotted out, wiped clean. And I love that idea because you know what? You and I, we struggle with guilt and sin in our lives, don't we? We struggle with, I've done this and I've done that. And it's so hard to let it go. And you know what? For Jesus, it's so easy. It's so, oh, brothers and sisters, it's so easy. And he just wipes it clean. He just wipes it clean. And so repentance is a word of hope. It's a word of hope. And then the second thing we talked about that about last week was this, Acts 3.26. The other, the other high point was God's great love. God's great love. I have never met a Christian who has not had questions about God's love. Have you ever had questions about God's love? God, do you love me? God, how can you love them? And we have questions, especially when we don't feel Him, or especially when we have um, fallen into sin or something like that. A lot of us struggle with the love of God. But we talked about that, about that last week in Acts 3.26. Here is, to me, such a reminder of the love of God. These are the people who said, crucify Jesus, right? And what does God say to the very people who said, crucify His only Son? God says, I raised up my servant Jesus and I send him back to the very people who condemned him, who rejected him, and who crucified him, that they might be blessed, that they might turn back from their sinful ways. I love, it's, it's warm in here, isn't it? Pastor Renee, there's some people uh, complaining about the, it's quite hot in the back for some. Sorry to interrupt the sermon, but there. Sorry. Let's keep going. But here's this beautiful passage. To bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. That's why, brothers and sisters, I said what I said earlier. We get all hung up on the unpardonable sin and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Honestly, if anybody would 
if, if anybody would say they've sinned too badly and gone too far, I would say it's the people that said crucify Jesus, wouldn't you? I mean, would there be anything worse than that? And yet, God gave them another chance. God said, you've not gone too far. God said, I love you so much. I have raised up my son Jesus and sent him back to you through the power, equipping of the Holy Spirit as the disciples came to them. So here we have, I, I don't know about you, I would have condemned, and so would you have, but I'm not God and you're not God, there is hope. May I encourage you this morning, if you have given up on some people, if you've been angry with people that have hurt you and have mocked you and condemned you because you're a Christian or for other reasons, let God put His love, His love in your heart again this morning that they might have hope. Probably God wants to reach them through you. Through you. Mm. God, send somebody else. <laughs> but God says, you. You. I can't do that, and you can't do that. But God can do that, if you'll let Him. If you'll let Him. Amen? Amen. That's a little bit, y'all are looking at me this morning like, Mm, you did. I know that you didn't like that point, but it's true. But it's true. Amen. Now, this was the first half of the story. We want to move on, and the second half of the story moves a lot more quickly. We've looked at power. We've looked at preaching. And what's the next part of this story? The next part of this story, mm, we've gone from power, healing, preaching, and now we go to persecution. Now let me ask you something as we consider persecution. How many of you have ever done what is right and you received ill in, in return? You did what was good and you received bad. How many of you, you showed kindness and you were shown in return unkindness? You gave fairness and what was given to you was what? Unfairness. And how many of us, let me not say you, how many of us then felt like, God, you weren't fair with me. God, you should have treated, God, you're not being very good to me. God, I tried to do what you said. I'm living for you and look at this. God, why did this happen? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever asked God that? God, I was being good. God, I was living for you. Why did you let this happen? Well, let me encourage you this morning. You are in good company. Here are Peter and John. They have, according to the direction of the Holy Spirit, healed a lame man, preached the gospel to many people, to wicked people who said crucify him, and they show their love, sent of God, and they're saying return and repent. And what happens to them? Acts 4. Now we move into the next chapter. Verses 1 through 3. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, here are three groups, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. And these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them. Mm, you thought you had been mistreated, didn't you? They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. Now, you know how disruptive it is in Lighthouse when somebody's phone goes beep, 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 and starts to ring. Everybody, we all get, we all get disrupted. Imagine what it would have been like when Peter and John were preaching, and they get arrested. That stops everything, doesn't it? That's an interruption. And we see what happens. We know that Peter and John are there. The healed man is there. The crowds are there. Everything has gone smoothly until this point. And then they're arrested. So let's talk about this. And we look at this, and I want us to look at this because this looks like something that the devil has done and God has nothing to do, has nothing to do with it. Well, I'll tell you this. I do believe that this is something that the devil did. God didn't plan 
God didn't say, let's arrest them. Evil men who were opposed to God came up and stopped them from preaching, okay? That was the enemy's work. But I want to encourage you this morning, as we see in this story, even when the enemy works, it does not stop what God is doing. Even when the enemy works, God is still working. And I'll tell you something else. God can use wicked people. We think God just uses good people. God can use wicked people to accomplish His purposes. He's God. He's God. And this is what we're going to see in this story. So they arrest him. And I want us to look just very quickly at the people that are opposing them. Now the crowd is listening. The crowd is paying attention. But suddenly the priests come up. The priests, these are the people that are supposed to represent God to everyone and are supposed to represent the people to God. And they come up and they confront Peter and John who are preaching about Jesus. All of the priests of Israel were divided into 24 groups, okay, into 24 groups. And if you'll remember, remember back when before uh, John was born, Zechariah, his father, and uh, was, he was performing his duties in the, in the temple, and the angel appeared to him and said, you're going to have a son, his name is going to be John, he's going to prepare the way. Zechariah was one of the godly priests, he was one of those 24 groups. So this, these are the priests who come up and they stop Peter and John. Who else is with him? The captain of the temple guard. Who's the captain of the temple guard? We have no name for him, but I can tell you about him. The captain of the temple guard would have been a Sadducee. He would have been part of this group. He was a priest himself and he, in terms of authority and position, was second to the high priest himself, the high priest himself. So it's a very, very high position. And so the captain of the temple guard comes. He's the one that's responsible for keeping order. And then the Sadducees came in. Who were the Sadducees? The Sadducees were another religious group that were like the Pharisees, but there were a lot of differences. The Sadducees did not believe in angels, heaven, hell, and they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Okay? And so it really bothered them when Peter and John were preaching that Jesus has been raised from the dead. The Sadducees were also generally aristocrats. They were usually wealthy, elite, rich, and educated. And this was the group that was in power. Caiaphas, Annas, the high priest, all of them were in the group of the Sadducees. And they didn't care so much about religion, honestly. They cared more to keep their position of authority and power. That's what they wanted to keep. And so they didn't want any disturbance. So they come up and they arrest them. Now, I want to talk for just a minute. Look at this. It says that through Jesus there's a resurrection of the dead. And I challenge you to dig a little bit deeper in this story. If you will, I gave you some homework last week and it was to look in chapter 4 and find out about the name of Jesus. Did you do that? Some of you did, and you probably, some of you said, no, I didn't. That's okay. You can do it now. Um, not now. You can do it after the service. But that's one of the things that we see in this story, the name, the name of Jesus, the power of the name of Jesus. And then one of the other things that you'll see in this story is this. Four times in this story, it talks about the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. And I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. This is something that even today, Christians don't want to talk about very much. Do you know why? Because it's so hard to believe. It's so incredible. It's so impossible. How can that be? It doesn't make any sense. But I want to tell you something. For the early church, the main thing Almost the number one thing that they talked about was this. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, why did they stress that? And let's look at what happens next. What we see is this. And next slide. What does the resurrection of Jesus mean? So let's look at some of these things. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, one of the things that the resurrection of Christ means what? First, He's the Son of God. 
and his word can be trusted. He's the son of God. Who can be raised from the dead? Who can be dead for three days and come back to life again? And he said that this is what would happen. Only the son of God. And if he said that, the most difficult thing to believe, the most difficult thing to happen, everything else he says and everything else he promises is true as well. So it's a mark, truly, amen. It's a mark. It's a seal of authentic. I am who I say I am. Jesus is the living God, the living God. And so that's one of the reasons they preached Jesus is raised from the dead. So what does it mean? And that's why they talked about it. He's the son of God and his word can be trusted. What else does it mean? It also means that his sacrifice for sin was acceptable to God so that we can be completely forgiven. Hallelujah and amen. If you ever have a question about, can God forgive me? Have I gone too far? Is it too terrible what I've done? You look at the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And the death and the resurrection of Jesus shouts into your life and into your heart. My sacrifice for your sin was enough. It was enough. And God accepted it. And you are free and you are clean, and you are innocent, and you are accepted of God and not condemned by God. That is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ says. Because the Bible is so clear. He took our sins, He bore them to the cross, and God received His sacrifice and said, yes, paid in full, so that you and I might go free. So the next time you feel accused, the next time you feel condemned by the enemy over your failing and your shortcoming, you come to God and you say, oh Jesus, your sacrifice for sin was acceptable. It was enough for this. And you are free. You are free. What else does it mean? It means the resurrection. It means that our Savior is alive and active and he's able to help us in times of need. Buddha cannot say that. Allah cannot say that. No other God of this world that, or is seen as God can say that. There is one who died and who raised from the dead and lives forevermore, ever interceding, ever helping, ever coming alongside. And it is the God and man, Jesus Christ. And he is alive for you and for me to help us. He is active on our behalf and able to help us in time of need. That's what the resurrection of Jesus means. What else does it mean? It also means that one day we too will conquer death. The world fears death. The world does everything to escape death. The world, we try to live forever. We try to, I'm afraid of this and I'm afraid of that. And I understand, brothers and sisters, there is a, a fear of the unknown. Even Christians sometimes, we fear it, don't we? What, what is it? Because we don't know what it's like or, or it, we're afraid of the pain of it or things like that. I want to encourage you this morning. I want to challenge you again this morning. We will overcome death because Jesus overcame death on our behalf. That's what the resurrection of Jesus means. And for the child of God, for the Christian, listen, for the child of God and for the Christian, death is only a doorway. Here and then we're in heaven. It's a doorway and we pass. For the Christian, death is is the necessary graduation from this life and this earthly flesh to an eternal body and an eternal home with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. That is what the resurrection of Jesus means. And that is why I know that one day, whether Jesus comes to receive me in the air through the rapture and I will ever be with Him, or whether He tarries His return and something happens to me and I die of old age or of sickness or whatever, though that is not my hope nor plan. But however I go through that, however God gets me to heaven, one day I shall overcome death. 
I shall overcome death. And I shall, I shall see, and you will see, Jesus, the one who overcame death on our behalf. I will see my grandmother and my grandfather on one side, my grandmother and my grandfather on the other side, who lived for God righteous lives and are now in heaven and have overcome death. Your relatives, your loved ones, those that you know, they've gone to be with the Lord. Yes, there is grief. Yes, there is sorrow. But it's only for this world, for they have overcome death. And they have because Jesus overcame it. Praise the Lord. This is why the early church talked about and preached, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. It is the foundation it is the foundation of the gospel message. And let it be your foundation as well. Amen. The Christian faith rests on the fact that the tomb was empty. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. There are no relics of Jesus floating around anywhere. There aren't. There aren't. There are no little finger bones of Jesus floating around. Do you, some of you, I don't know if you remember, those of you that have been in Hong Kong a long time, it was I think almost 17 years ago, I don't know if Pastor Renee, do you remember that when the little finger bone of Buddha came in, in a sh shrine, was brought from Taiwan to Hong Kong for a very short time, do you remember that? And maybe a tooth or something like that. It was a huge thing. And everybody, oh, and I'm not trying to, mo well, I guess I am a little bit. I'm sorry. But, but, I, I, but, but I, I look at that, and, and I know you too, and I think, honestly, honestly, in truth and in honesty, from a, from a pure heart, I looked at that, and there was a sadness and a joy as well. It's like, I have nothing of Jesus on this earth, <laughs> physical, on this earth. Why? because he rose from the dead. He's not in a grave anywhere. No bone, no tooth, no this, no that, nothing. That's right, amen, 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 amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and because he lives, we too shall live. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Now, they stopped the message, but they couldn't, they, sorry, they stopped the messengers. I, I got it wrong. They stopped the messengers, but they couldn't stop the message. Acts 4.4. 4. They arrest them. They throw them into jail. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled how many? About 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Now, women, don't be offended. Children, don't be offended. What about us? That was how they counted in those days, okay? So up to 5,000, there had been 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. When I read this, my heart just overflows with joy and hope for my own life and for my own prayers and for the lives of many Christians around the world who are persecuted and who are thrown into prison for their faith and for their preaching and for their lives to the north of us, in North Korea, in Iran, in other areas, in many places around the world, in Burma still today, in, in, in India, in places in India where the messengers of God are violently opposed, violently stopped. But the message of God cannot be stopped, brothers and sisters. It cannot be stopped. And this is why you and I have a responsibility. We continue to pray. We continue to preach. We continue to speak. We continue to live. Some of you, I've told you maybe many years ago, I told you this story before. I can't, I, I think it was when mom and dad were still here. Um, and I had gone with dad, not, not mom, but I had gone with dad and we were, we were speaking with a group that Pastor Renee knows very well. In, uh, the group was from uh, one of the bigger provinces of Hunan, uh, 
from Hunan province, <laughs> there you go, mm -hmm. um, where there were many, many Christians. And um, we met with this group. They were all church leaders. They were all pastors or evangelists of the house church, of the house church in China. And as we met with them, I think every single person, it wasn't a large group, it was maybe 18 people, 18 men and women, young men and young women, and older ones as well. The oldest one, the old pastor, was almost 80 years old. He had been in prison. I think he said, I'm trying to remember now, I've got it written down. I think he had been imprisoned, I believe, 18 times. 18 times for being a minister of the gospel. And yet, there he sat. He hadn't turned away, and he hadn't turned his back, and he hadn't stopped preaching. The messenger may be thrown in prison, and the messenger may be stopped, but the message goes forth. The message goes forth. One of the young women that was part of that group, um, she said, uh, she said that her she was a, she was one of the evangelists of the church, and she was sent out with another sister. They had uh, another sister in the church into a neighboring town, and she was preaching the gospel. They were going door to door evangelizing, and her very first evangelistic trip. She was 16 years old. 16, 16, and she was arrested. She and her friend were arrested the very first time they had gone out. And she had been arrested several times since then. And actually, before they came to us in the months before we all met together, most of them had been arrested in a, uh, in a meeting. And it was really one of the things that, that blessed me so much was about, about their testimony was this. They had been meeting together, they were preaching the gospel, and then they were caught, and they were all thrown in, uh, thrown in the jail. The men, on, of course, the men with the men, and then the women with the women. And they... Um, uh, the women said in their cell there were about 16 other women that were there as well, in there for various crimes. And then she and the other one, I think there were two or three of these women who were evangelists and preachers who were put in, who were thrown into the cell with all of these others. And they were there for about 16 days. Do you know what happened in those 16 days that they were there? In the 16 days that they were de there, they led every single other woman prisoner in that cell, they led them to the Lord. Every single one of them became a Christian. Every single one of them came to the Lord. We look at difficulties and we look at opposition and we feel like, oh, it's so hard. It's been stopped. But brothers and sisters, the message of God cannot be stopped. The message of God cannot be stopped. And I want to say something to you this morning. Listen carefully. Some of you in your homes and in your work and in your business, you are very free to share the gospel. You're very free. You can share freely and there's an openness. Sometimes people oppose, but you can share freely. But I want to encourage you and especially the rest of you who may be in positions and in places where you really cannot speak. Your employer doesn't want to hear it. On your job, you've been told, don't talk about that Jesus stuff. Or you have a family that really opposes your Christian stand. And you feel like, I can't, what can I say? What can I, I can't, I can't say anything. When you cannot say anything, you can still live for God. When you cannot say anything, you can still love those who oppose you. When you cannot say anything, you can still pray because the message of God is not stopped. The message of God is not stopped. And that's what I see as we look at this. Thrown into prison, but what? 2,000 men believe, and there probably would have been at least that many women and more children as well. God's message cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. And here's one of the things that we see. Remember at the very beginning when we talked about why wouldn't Jesus heal that lame man when he walked by day after day going in and out of the temple? Why? Because there were 2,000 people and more that also needed salvation. That also needed salvation. If we don't understand God's ways and we think something is wrong, Keep on hanging on and wait for God to make it clear. Amen.
Amen. So they're thrown into jail. And then what happens the next day? In Acts 4, 5 through 7, what do we see? The next day, all of their enemies get together. All the rulers, the elders, the teachers of religious law, Annas the high priest, Caiaphas. I'll tell you something. You don't, you, here's a little bit of background. They call him the high priest, but you know what? Annas was no longer the high priest. This family and this group was so corrupt that they didn't even follow God's laws anymore. They didn't even follow what they were supposed to do. Annas was not really the high priest anymore, but he retained the power, and so they called him the high priest still. And his son-in-law, Caiaphas, because he wanted to keep power, Annas by himself had made Caiaphas the high priest. In addition to that, at one point, his grandson was high priest and five of his sons were also high priests at various times, completely opposed to the way it was supposed to work. These are the enemies of God. And then others, John and Alexander, and I, sorry, that's to make sure you're awake. <laughs> and others that we won't go into for the sake of time, but they were wealthy people, all of the, tri of the group of the Sadducees. These are the enemies of Peter and John, and I'll tell you something else. They are the enemies of Jesus Christ. This, you go back, if you read all the way back, before Jesus was, before he, when he was tried and when he was crucified, this is exactly the same group that condemned Jesus to death. And where Jesus had stood on trial, his followers now also stood on trial before the very same group. I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. If you have become a Christian hoping that my life will be easy peasy and everything's going to be smooth now, I want to tell you something. You will be disappointed because our lives will not always be smooth. Our lives will not always be easy. If Jesus faced these things, we too will face these things. But because He faced them and overcame them, He will stand with us when we face them as well. And they stand before Him. These people are the who's who of society. These people are the cream of the crop, the top of the top. They know everything. They know the Word of God, but they don't know the God of the Word. They know all of the rules, but they don't know the love of God. And there's a lesson for you and for me. We can know a lot about the Bible, and sometimes we do, don't we? I can quote verses. I know this and I know that, and we're telling other people. But I want to tell you something. Knowing up here is not the same thing as knowing here and living a life that is worthy of the of the Lord God. It's got to come more from our, it can't just be in our heads. It's, a, it's got to be in our hearts, and it's got to be in our lives as well. Be careful, be careful about people who can quote scripture right, left, up, down, center, in and out, but don't live a godly life. Be careful, be careful for that. Live for God. Study to know His Word. Take time to memorize. We should know those things. We should do those things. But let the truth of God transform your life. And if the truth that you are reading and the truth that you are memorizing has not transformed your life, then it's not doing what God intended for it to do. Because truth is given to transform us that we might conform to the Word of God. So here are these men that know it all, but they don't know God. They don't know God. And I, we look at this and here again, look at verse 7. If you didn't do your homework, here's part of your homework. Here's the answer to your homework. What is the question that they ask? By what power or in whose name have you done this? I love this. You know, they're accusing and they want to condemn Peter and John. And what has just happened? They have just set themselves up for the best answer in the world, right? Who's doing, by whose authority? Whose power have you done this? Oh, God set that up, didn't he? God set that up. And then, so there's our, there's our theme again. And I want to, for just a minute, <laughs> I want to, for just a minute, encourage you in this. I want you to imagine, because this really happened. Peter and John were really there. They really faced opposition. They really faced 
an enemy. How many were there? Well, if the whole group gathered, there would have been 71 men against them because this was the gathering of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of 70. So it was 70 plus the high priest. So there were 71. Now, and this is what they would do. The Sanhedrin would sit in a semicircle and then they would call the person or the persons to stand in front of them. The Sanhedrin usually would be seated and then the person on trial or the witnesses would stand in the semicircle. So this is the picture. Get this picture. And I want you to put yourself there just a minute. And I want you to put yourself there because we face difficulties like this sometimes. It's 71 versus how many? Two plus the lame man. So maybe, now they don't mention the lame man here, but the lame man was there as we read a little bit further. And I can tell you the lame man was on Peter and John's side, right? Yes. So two plus one. Let's go ahead and say three, okay? So 71 versus three. Educated versus uneducated. Powerful against the powerless. The elite aristocrats against two ex-fishermen and one beggar. Those are the odds. Now, look carefully and think deeply right now. God keeps His promises. God keeps His promises. Here they are, facing impossible odds, an impossible situation. But Jesus knew that they would. And Jesus knows that you will. And when Jesus walked the earth, what did He say to them? He said, and keep up with me, okay? What did He say? Matthew 10, 18 through 20. You will stand trial before governors and kings. Why? Because you're my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and the other unbelievers about me. When you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And in Luke, what does he say? I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. This was the promise of Jesus. Now, think about this for just a minute and put yourself here in closing this morning. You and I this morning do not face arrest or imprisonment, do we? Anybody facing jail time for following Jesus right now? Here. No. Nobody here. There are brothers and sisters around the world who are facing that. And yet, we do face opposition. Some of you this morning face hostile family members because you have chosen to follow God. Some of you have employers that delight because you're a Christian and they're not. They delight in making it harder for you, in, in making it more difficult for you. Some of you who are in business are facing situations where everybody around you does it by a shortcut, that does it to make more money, or does it this way, or bends the law, or bends the rules, and you're trying to live honestly and uprightly, you're trying to do the right thing as a godly businessman or as a godly businesswoman because God, a holy God, lives in you, and the people around you mock you and laugh, laugh at you and tell you there's no way you'll get ahead if you put God first and they're laughing at you and you're looking at your, you're looking at your situation and you're thinking how will I ever get ahead there's some of you who are students who are facing a system of learning or education or other classmates and you think they they're all against me it's all against god and you face opposition and you think what am i going to do and how am i going to get through and you feel overwhelmed you feel overwhelmed listen this morning and look at the promise of god to you you are not alone. 
You are not powerless. You are not outnumbered. You are not outsmarted. If you stand for Jesus, Jesus will stand with you. He will stand with you. Stand for Jesus and He will stand with you. And you are not overcome. You are not outnumbered. When Jesus is with you, you are in the majority. When Jesus is with you, you have the upper hand because Jesus has overcome. He keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. He would not say this just to make them feel a little bit better. Jesus keeps his promises. And he says to you, and he says to me this morning, when you, may I paraphrase? You and I are not here, but we do face opposition. And this is the promise of Jesus to every follower of His who will stand for Him. And I want to tell you something, and I want to encourage some of you this morning. Some of you are really struggling because your strongest opposition is coming from the people who are closest to you. They are part of your family. They are people you've grown up with. They may be parents. They may be cousins, they may be husbands, they may be wives, they may be children, they may be people that you thought were your friends. But I want you to know something this morning. Stand for Jesus and Jesus will stand with you. And don't worry about, how can I say? What do I say? God will give you the right words at the right time. It's not your wisdom that will overcome. It is His wisdom. And you say, but God, get me out of it. Oh God, deliver me. Oh God. I don't want to be in this situation. Oh God, I don't want to face this. May I say to you what I think God is probably saying to some of you, but you haven't heard it yet? God is saying, you are my child and you're in that situation because in that situation, this will be your opportunity to tell them, people in power and others, about me. Because God loves them too. Though they are hateful, God loves them too. Though they are unkind. And God wants them to know His love. God wants them to repent so that they will have hope. Those 16 women in China that were in prison, God wanted them to hear the gospel. Well, how are they going to hear the gospel? They're in prison. There's no church there. There's no preacher there. And so what did God say? Well, I'll use the enemy's wicked plans to arrest my children because I'm going to stand with them. And in that prison, they're going to stand for me. And then I will stand with them. And there will be the opportunity to tell them about me that there might be hope. Don't give up. Don't despair. Don't turn back. Stand for Jesus and He will stand with you. Amen? Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this morning, and God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your promises that you keep. Your, in your word, you say you keep every one of your promises. And Lord, we stand this morning on this promise that you will be with us when the enemy is against us, when the world system is against us, when we look at it and we think, how can I overcome? How can I stand for you? It's too difficult. Oh God, oh God, may we know that Jesus is standing with us, that your Holy Spirit will come again, and that your Spirit, just as you did, with Peter, that your spirit will fill us and that your spirit will give us your words to stay and your strength to stand and your love to hold firm and to hold fast. Oh God, may your people, may Lighthouse this day, may the people of Lighthouse stand for you when they walk out these doors with their families, in their businesses, with their employers, in their classrooms. Oh Lord, may they know that you are with them and they are not alone but that you stand with us. And because you stand with us, we are not in the minority. We are in the majority, and it's your majority. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you keep your promises to your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.